Hej, mit navn er Leif Jensen, og sammen med vores CTO, Anders Delsen, så er jeg i spidsen for ESET her i Norden. Vi har i dag afholdt Europæisk Cyber Security Day her i Eksperimentariet i København. Og for dig, der ikke har mulighed for at være her, så har vi samlet tre af de mest spændende præsentationer fra i dag i den her video. Det handler blandt andet om cyberangreb øh, udledt i forbindelse med øh, krigen i Ukraine. Så handler det om artificial intelligence, eller som jeg hellere vil kalde det, machine learning, og hvordan øh, både os i IT-sikkerhedsindustrien bruger det, men også hvordan de IT-kriminelle bruger machine learning for at øh, komme, forsøge at komme et skridt foran. Og så den sidste præsentation, det er omkring øh, det helt aktuelle trusselslandskab. Alle tre præsentationer er lavet direkte af vores øh, research team i Slovakiet, fuldstændig ufiltreret og ikke pakket ind i hverken salg eller marketing. Så jeg vil anbefale, at du tanker en dejlig kop kaffe eller te, eller hvad du nu drikker, et stykke frugt eller et stykke kage, og læner dig tilbage, og så nyder de her tre præsentationer. God fornøjelse. Go into a little bit more detail, uh, as the previous uh, speaker mentioned, uh, into the things that we see uh, in terms of cyber attacks in Ukraine. And due to our unique visibility and our presence uh, in defending uh, Ukrainian critical infrastructure, as well as uh, both uh, public and private sector organizations, we do see quite a lot. So my name is Robert Lipovsky, and uh, all of the things that I'll be presenting here uh, are the results of our research, uh, the, the, both my team and the other research teams that we have in ESET. So uh, let's get right to it. Uh, could I ask the directors to move the slide so I can see the current slide and the notes half by half, please? Okay, so we all know about the events that happened on the 24th of February. And then, uh, just a couple of hours before the invasion actually took place, uh, we have seen a disruptive piece of malware that we labeled uh, Hermetic Wiper uh, spread in Ukraine. Um, this, of course, pre, uh, predated uh, the attack. Uh, when, once we discovered it, we were analyzing it's uh, quite heavily not knowing what would happen uh, the next morning. Um, then another important event on this timeline and the most, uh, the most noteworthy, the most impactful, or well, I wouldn't say impactful, but definitely the most noteworthy uh, attack that we've seen in Ukraine was in Destroy 2. And I'll get to all of this and we'll cover it in quite a lot of detail in just a second. But before we get into that, before we get into all of those details, let's take a step back in time because uh, these things, these uh, highly advanced cyber attacks against Ukrainian targets have been happening for quite some time. And we have been seeing uh, an increased number of cyber attacks since around 2014. So there are a lot of APT groups. We are tracking all of these uh, campaigns and attributing them to various uh, groups. Some of uh, you, them you can see here, and we don't have time to get into all of those attacks here. So, and even this is not a comprehensive list. So, so these are just some of the ones that I picked that I think are the most notable ones. Um, but there, there are more, more even and we'll highlight this one, which in my, my opinion is the most infamous one and has been causing the most, uh, most wide damage. This group has been uh, attributed by the US DOJ, um, as well as the UK, uh, uh, UK uh, agencies uh, to the Russian uh, GRU. And in October 2020, uh, this indictment came out with uh, the indictment of these, uh, these six Knights Fellows. Okay, uh, in case you're wondering uh, where the name Sandworm comes from, uh, how did this name uh, came to light? Well, this is where, where it got its name from. Uh, so in one of the early black energy cases, we've seen this, uh, these, these are actually decrypted. So they were, they were uh, uh, encoded uh, strings within the command and control, uh, com control server domain, uh, domains listed there. And these were being used by the black energy malware in some of the early campaigns around uh, 2014. So apparently uh, these attackers were, f 
were fans of Frank Herbert's classic novel. That's where Sandworm came, uh, got its name from. Okay, so we've been tracking the, the activities of this uh, threat group for, for a really long time now. And we've detected uh, their attacks uh, against high value targets in Ukraine since, even before this, since, since around the, the end of 2013 is when they intensified. Um, we've did, we detected some Sandworm campaigns even before that, around 2012, but, but they really intensified at the end of 2013 and the beginning of 2014. So this, this, this correlates with the geopolitical situation that was happening there, the beginning of the war in uh, Donbass and the Russian occupation of Crimea. Sandworm targeted all types of organizations, so its targeting was, was really broad. Uh, and they included government, diplomatic, uh, media organizations, transportation, so, so all, uh, all areas uh, of the country, all types of industries. One of the main methods that Sandworm was using to infiltrate the targeted organizations was through carefully crafted spear phishing emails. And they have been using this as their main, main way of getting inside of these, uh, these networks for, for, for all, those, all those years. It was not the only method, but it is the most commonly used methods. Um, here's one example that actually used the war in Donbass as, as a lure. Um, I'll use my cheat sheet here for the translation. So this email reads that Arseniy Yatsenyuk, who was the prime minister at the time, uh, is instructing the prosecutor general's office, the security service of Ukraine, the Ministry of Internal Affairs and the Ministry of Justice to check all members of parliament, parties and NGOs in Ukraine for their involvement, alleged involvement, in the support of rebels in the east of Ukraine and that in the attachment, you would see the list of these potential alleged uh, uh, supporters who are conspiring uh, with, the, with the separatists uh, in Donbass. So this is the attachment, of course, with, with a theme like this, uh, this uh, the recipients would probably have a high chance of, of opening this. So this is really good social engineer here. These are not your common Nigerian prince scams. And what was happening in the background is even from a technical point of view, uh, this was this was pretty uh, pretty Im important and pretty impactful because this was actually using a zero day in PowerPoint uh, to uh, to launch the black energy malware in the background. So uh, the victim could have all the latest and greatest versions installed, all their Windows, their Microsoft Office, all their applications patched, and they would still be uh, still be infected because of the sandworm using this zero day vulnerability. Once we discovered it, we worked with Microsoft, reported it, and, and eventually uh, it got patched. So this is the other, other part in that presentation. Um, what was Black Energy about? So it was a pretty, pretty general purpose uh, a cyber weapon. Uh, so it was a modular framework, uh, it consisted of a main module communicating with uh, the command and control server. Uh, some of those domains that I, that I showed you in the earlier slide were using the, the Sandworm uh, book references. And it was modular, meaning that it, it, its functionality relied on these different plugins, uh, some of the examples uh, that you can see here. And it's the typical functionality that you would expect from a tool like this. So, so stealing various uh, types of uh, sensitive information off of their targets, as well as uh, plugins allowing them lateral movement across the network. Um, Black Energy was used in many campaigns. There were, there were you know, a lot of waves, a lot of campaigns in Ukraine against many organizations. But definitely the most notable attack was the one against the Ukrainian power grid. So this was the culmination of, of this campaign, a very visible culmination that we've seen in December 2015, because this was the first ever blackout caused by a cyber attack. Um, this attack, it was... I say facilitated, and I underline that, that word, facilitated, because um, black energy didn't cause the, the blackout directly, but instead it opened the door for the attackers uh, and, and enabled them to do it. Um, it was carried out in a coordinated manner uh, against at least four uh, electric distribution companies in various regions all around the country, so-called Obel Energo companies from Oblast regional uh, electric distribution companies. 
So the attackers misuse remote access uh, connections to manually switch off the flow of electricity to de-energize uh, these substations and as an effect uh, the homes of around a quarter million Ukrainians across the nation uh, went uh, went dark for up to six hours depending on on which region was was uh, targeted so that was December uh, 2015 uh, that was the first mass power outage uh, caused by a cyber attack, but the attackers didn't stop there. And almost exactly one year later, there was another blackout. This one was not facilitated. This was, was directly caused by a piece of malware, which we uh, named Indestroyer. And this time the attackers stepped up their game. Um, there were quite a number of differences between, between the, the, the attack uh, previously. Uh, we know of only one uh, electricity substation being hit, but a large one this time, Kiev North Transmission Substation. So the potential impact uh, would have been uh, even greater. And I'm using the conditional would have been because the attackers ultimately did not accomplish uh, their intended goals. Uh, the malware they used in Destroyer, unlike Black Energy before, it was the first ever malware specifically designed to attack power grids. And what that means exactly is that it was going after these kinds of devices. So here you see examples from uh, two different uh, vendors, Siemens and ABB. Both of these uh, protection relays were targeted by, by Indestroyer. And it was able to do this on scale. It was uh, able to send commands to these devices. It, uh, so to speak, spoke the language of, of this hardware. Uh, using one of specific industrial communication protocols. Um, I'm not going to go into all the technical details about its architecture, but what it, what's important here is that this launcher component was, was hardwired triggered to, to launch these disruptive payloads at a specific time. So that was December 17th at uh, 2200 hours, 27, uh, 27 minutes uh, UTC time. And then it executed these, uh, these payloads. So these are the individual payloads for each of those communication protocols. This is not the typical capability of, of you know, regular malware that, that we see on a daily basis. Uh, and this wasn't it. So this, these, were the, these were the modules that, that would be used to uh, send commands uh, to these devices to effectively uh, open circuit breakers and, and cause, uh, cause the blackout and de-energize the substation. But there were other components uh, to this attack to, to amplify this impact and to cause even greater damage. One of those components was a data wiper. And as you'll see in, in the other types of attacks uh, that I'll be talking about, this is kind of a common theme uh, for sandworms, so also for causing, causing uh, having, having wiper capability. So similar wiper capabilities were also present in the black energy campaigns. So this was used to uh, deny the operators at those substations visibility and control of their environment. And of course, to make, uh, make recovery from this incident a lot more difficult. And then there was another functionality, uh, which, which is probably the most, most important and most impactful one, especially in combination with these, with these previous ones. Uh, and that's a denial of service uh, attack against uh, specific Siemens uh, Cypertech protection relays. What this means, these protection relays are in place uh, to, to balance out the power grid, to, to protect from uh, unsafe conditions. Uh, there, are, there are overcurrent protection relays, there are various types of protection relays, not going to uh, electrical engineering class, but it's really important uh, for the grid to have them in place and protect the grid and protect, protect the, the, the hardware on site. So Indestroyer was trying to, was attempting to take these devices offline using uh, a previously known vulnerability. So in this case, it was not a zero day, and it was described also in this, uh, in this ICS cert, uh, now under CISA uh, advisory. And why were they doing that? What were they trying to accomplish with that? So the attackers already knew from the Black Energy incident in 2015 that the, uh, that the Ukrainian uh, operators had both the capability and the willingness to go into manual mode of operations. So they, they expected that they would recover from this attack, from those uh, four payloads sending the commands to de-energize the substation so that they would switch to manual mode and try to restore the flow of electricity. So they expected that. And then since their visibility and control of the environment was denied 
through the data wiper module, they would take off these protection relays, uh, take them offline, and once they would uh, go into manual mode and restore the flow of electricity, then this could potentially lead them to unsafe conditions in the environment and potentially even causing, uh, causing physical damage to equipment. And thus, the attempted damage was not a matter of a blackout lasting, lasting hours, but the attackers intended for a much larger scale and much longer duration blackout uh, that could potentially last weeks, even months, uh, during which uh, the equipment would have to be repaired, restored, and so on. Fortunately, this did not happen. Uh, there were lots, uh, the Ukrainian uh, operators were able to, to recover. Uh, they had past experience from the previous incident already. And, and there were also some flaws, some bugs in the code of industry, and they ultimately failed in these grand ambitions. But it did cause a blackout, nevertheless, uh, lasting for around one hour. Okay, so let's move on uh, with uh, the other types of attacks uh, that uh, this group has under its belt. And I think NotPetya needs, uh, doesn't need a long introduction, so I'll quickly go through this. This was a disruptive far ransomware, so it was masquerading as ransomware, even, but financial gain was not its motivation. Um, and it spread all over the country. Uh, so its, its goal was to disrupt, to, 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 to sow chaos, to disrupt operations uh, throughout the, the whole country of Ukraine. I mean, people couldn't g buy gas at gas stations. People couldn't pay at point of sales terminals. Um, and how did they accomplish this? So that was through pretty aggressive spreading mechanisms uh, implemented in the code, including uh, the eternal blue. Uh, vulnerabilities there, but not only those other vulnerability, uh, other, other mechanisms uh, as well. Um, and it was able to, to spread all over the country because of uh, a supply chain attack of financial software that was the most popular financial software in Ukraine, uh, used in the majority of businesses, and that is, uh, that is MEDOC. So this was a supply chain attack against this legitimate company, and through the updates, of MEDOC, all of its customers, uh, all of its users of their software would then be infected. And through this uh, backdoor, basically, the attackers would then be able to launch the NotPetya uh, infection. And then NotPetya itself would, would have further mechanisms for spreading. And because of VPN connections, uh, even, even uh, outside of the, the country, as we all know, uh, the potential, the, the, the destructive impact was felt not only within Ukraine, but also all over the world, including uh, some of the world's largest corporations uh, like Maersk and so on. So uh, according to some, some of the estimates, uh, this has become the most damaging, the most costly cyber attack uh, in history. And according to the reported damages by the, the affected uh, corporations, uh, they add up to over $10 billion in damages. Okay, so these were some of those um, most notable, most noteworthy uh, attacks by Sandworm uh, in the past. And then in the recent years, 2018, 2019, things kind of quieted down. Um, but the important thing to note here as, is that uh, the group continued its activities, but they were, they were a little less visible. They, they kept a, a lower profile until now. So now we're moving to, to the more present events. I already mentioned uh, Hermetic Wiper, which happened just a couple of hours uh, before the invasion. So it, this started shortly before 5 p.m. Uh, Ukrainian local time. Um, we, this was a pretty busy night, so, so we spent uh, analyzing this and, and we reported on this uh, pretty quickly, uh, including on our uh, reset, uh, research uh, Twitter account. Of course, not knowing uh, the events that we would wake up to the next morning. Uh, we found Hermetic Wiper on hundreds of systems in at least five Ukrainian organizations. And it was trying to corrupt the data in these organizations uh, to render them unbootable. So again, a disruptive uh, functionality. Um, and of course, as a result of this, any public facing services that, that were run by these organizations, then they would not be, not be accessible. 
on a technical level, what it was doing is basically would overwrite uh, the master boot record, the master file table, uh, files uh, the, the hives containing the, the registry, Windows registry, and also several other critical uh, parts uh, of on the hard drives with random bytes. Uh, it would also uh, disable uh, the volume shadow copy service to make recovery efforts more difficult. Uh, the compilation timestamp uh, do know that compilation timestamps can be faked by attackers, but uh, what we've been seeing in a lot of these attacks is that this, uh, these uh, timestamps coincide with our telemetry. So, so uh, and in a lot, a lot of the cases, the attackers just simply don't bother. So, so um, I think we can assume that these compilation timestamps are valid. Um, so this means uh, that the attack, uh, that the preparation for this attack predated for at least two weeks. So, so, so the malware uh, was created uh, two weeks before it was actually launched. Why the name Hermetic Wiper? Uh, because uh, these, this malware, not only, uh, not only Wizard, but also the other ones that I'll talk, in, talk about in just a second, uh, they use code signing certificates uh, uh, published uh, or, or uh, assigned to a Cypriot uh, company. Uh, called Hermetica Digital. Um, we requested the issuing certificate authority to revoke them after, and, and they did after we, we announced it. Um, there are various uh, theories as to, as, as to what happened. Uh, one potential and likely one is that this was uh, an organization uh, that the attackers Im Im impersonated and then got this certificate from, from Digis Digicert. Um, but Hermetic Wiper was not deployed in isolation. Uh, there were other pieces of malware uh, deployed in this destructive campaign, and that's Hermetic Wizard. Um, that's the second piece, and this is a worm. So this has, this has uh, the capability to spread uh, on the local network uh, and to deploy Hermetic Wiper. Uh, it was using uh, various, uh, various modules. There were WMI spreaders and there were SMB spreaders. Um, and the third piece that was used in tandem with, with uh, Hermetic Wiper and Hermetic Wizard uh, was Hermetic Ransom, which again appeared as, as a ransomware uh, written in, in Go and deployed uh, around the same time. So this was actually a bit puzzling. It, I mean, if you think about it, it doesn't really make sense. Like why, why deploy a ransomware when you're deploying a wiper as well? Um, but from a high-level perspective, it, it resembles what we've seen in the past, kind of, with, with NotPetya. So perhaps this was to hide the wiper's actions, make it, make it appear uh, as, 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 as ransomware. Um, also, what's interesting is that there's also a reference. So the SMB spreader in Hermetic Wizard uh, was named Romance DLL. It was not using uh, the Eternal Romance uh, exploit, the, the exploit of the Eternal Romance vulnerability. Um, but it certainly was a reference uh, to that. Uh, here's, here's an example of the ransom note uh, that was uh, displayed by uh, Hermetic Ransom. And here's, here are some, some Easter eggs uh, left in the binary. So, uh, you know, some messages perhaps uh, by the attackers. Then on March 14th, uh, we found yet another wiper in Ukraine, and, and these are not even, even all of them that, that we've seen. So I'm, I'm deliberately taking uh, some of them out because there were just so many uh, that, that, that we've uncovered. Um, and this one was, was a caddy wiper, uh, named after the, after the file name that the malware used. Um, here's, here's a quick compilation of, of what it looks like, what its activities look like, and it's doing a pretty similar thing to, to uh, Hermetic Wiper, so it's uh, uh, wiping the critical parts of, of the computer and then making them, them unbootable. Uh, but this one was, was uh, one of the most sophisticated wipers in terms of implementation uh, that we've seen. Uh, what's particularly no noteworthy is that it was avoiding the destruction of domain controllers. So, so this was likely to, to maintain the attacker's access inside that organization. So not to cripple uh, the AD, but to, re to, to remain, uh, keep that access and dis destruct all of the others, other machines. Uh, we've seen this on a few dozen 
systems in a limited number of uh, organizations in financial sector, uh, like a bank, uh, for example. And there were some similarities to, to uh, Hermetic uh, Wiper as well. For example, it was being deployed by group policies. Again, an indication that this was a planned APT type of attack uh, and that the attackers had prior access in, in those targeted systems for, uh, for some time before. And then on April 8th, uh, we discovered uh, with the tight co cooperation with the Ukrainian CERT, another version, the second version of Indestroyer. Um, so after all of these wipers, uh, this was, as I mentioned, the most notable uh, discovery in terms of uh, malware tradecraft uh, during, during the conflict. Uh, the good news here is that it didn't accomplish even what Indestroyer 1 accomplished. Um, and I'll get to a couple of the reasons why, why, why that happened. So this was the third case in history. Uh, where malware tried to tamper with the distribution of electricity uh, and to trigger a blackout. It was the third time uh, that this was done by Sandworm and the third time it was done in Ukraine, and this time during, during uh, the ongoing war uh, happening there. Um, so this attack was thwarted, um, and thanks to UA CERT, uh, we were able to, to analyze uh, this incident, so this Kudos to them and, and a really good response here and also the affected uh, Obel Energo company, uh, which we are not naming, uh, but uh, this serves electricity for a region with, with uh, over 2 million people. So had this attack been successful, um, the impact would have been uh, of over 2 million people being left in the dark in the times that Ukraine is, is, is in right now. Um, there are a number of notable differences between Industry 2 and Industry 1. Um, but before getting into those, uh, the compilation timestamp here goes to March 23rd. So again, uh, planning the attack for at least two weeks. So this is, this is the evidence for what we have uh, at least, but, but most likely even, even a, lot, a lot further back than that. Um, and the most notable technical difference is that uh, if you remember those protocols that Industry 1 spoke, all the four of them, Industry 2 speaks only one. It speaks only IEC 104, and that's due to various developments in the energy industry, and, and for, them, for the attackers evaluating that, this would be the most effective to, to achieve their goals. Uh, it also fixed some of the flaws that were within Industry 1, apparently, so, so uh, this, this uh, they attempted to make this work this time, and, and the good news is that uh, the defenders were able uh, to, to mitigate and, and, and protect from this threat executing. Um, but there is actual code similarity with, with the previous version of Industry, so it appears that they, they, they originate from the same source code. Uh, just one quick example is, is this function, uh, so, so you can notice some of the text strings that are reused are actually same or, or very similar. Okay, and similar to um, Indestroyer, Industry 2 was actually a lot simpler in architecture. So, so if you mention that, that diagram with, with the modular framework uh, in, of, of Industry 1, uh, Industry 2 was, was, a single, was executed as a single executable. Uh, which implemented this, this uh, IEC 104 protocol, but it was actually co-deployed with other pieces of malware. So, so standalone executables, but, but it was launched uh, with those as well. And this is, this is one that, that I've mentioned already, and that was a new version of uh, Caddy Wiper. So it was wiping, uh, again, the C slash uh, users folder and the whole hard drives from D onwards, overwriting all the files with zeros. Uh, and again, erasing the master boot record or the, the GPT, making the machine unbootable. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, it uh, was this new version of Caddy Wiper was uh, launched by a new loader uh, that UA CERT uh, named Argue Patched. And what's interesting about it is that it was a patched version of the rem remote uh, IDA Pro debugger server. Um, IDA Pro is, is a piece of software that we are using to analyze this malware. So, so it's a tool for reverse engineers. 
And there's no real good reason to, to, to name this in, in an electrical substation. Electrical substation uh, operators don't use IDA. Uh, so, so this was not an attempt to, to masquerade it as some legitimate piece of uh, software that would be used in this environment. Uh, this was likely the attackers trolling us analysts. Uh, in addition to, to these pieces of malware uh, targeting Windows machines, there were also uh, wipers uh, targeting uh, Linux and Solaris. Uh, that, so that's Solar Shred and, and Awful Shred. And Orc Shred is actually, again, so you, you can see a recurring theme here. This is an actual, uh, actually a worm component uh, spreading either Solar Shred or Awful Shred, depending on uh, the operating system that's, that's being used. Here is a timeline of the events uh, as, as, as it unfolded according to uh, the things that we've seen. So first, Caddy Wiper was launched on some, um, some Windows machines, and, and then the Linux and Solaris malware uh, was launched in, in the environment. Um, then the attackers created a scheduled task to launch in Destroyer 2. Uh, the execution of in Destroyer 2 was timed uh, to 16 uh, hours, 10 minutes uh, UTC time. And then after that, there was a scheduled execution of Caddy Wiper on that same machine, probably to erase traces uh, to cover their tracks after Indestroyer had, had run. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, there are many more APG groups uh, conducting attacks against Ukraine uh, that we don't have time to go into today. Uh, but we do often publish our findings on, on all of these groups. We track them closely. Uh, you can read a lot, of, a lot about these discoveries in our public uh, We Live Security blog posts. And that brings me to the, to the conclusion of my presentation and wrap up. So uh, if we look at this from, from, from a high per, higher, higher perspective, what were the attackers' main objectives? And we can divide them into two categories. Uh, the first one being a espionage, an espionage and data collection. Uh, that's kind of the silent phase. And then it's the visible phase of, of the sabotage and signaling uh, to, to the victim, signaling to the, to the enemy. Uh, these objectives are not mutually exclusive. So, so we quite often see campaigns combining these two. First, it's the, the espionage phase. And then the attackers will make themselves known through the disruptive capability. OK, so, so what's next? Uh, we certainly can expect the, the attacks to continue. Um, we've mostly spoke about Ukraine, but Sandworm, as well as some of the other APT groups uh, that have been targeting Ukraine, have been targeting uh, other countries as well. So, so that's definitely something to, to keep in mind. So, and users, defenders, IT admins need to, be, need to stay alert. And at said we'll continue monitoring uh, the attacker's activity and, of course, protecting uh, users uh, of our security software, but also provide actionable threat intelligence in our, uh, in our threat intelligence report or our threat intelligence uh, feeds. And also, since, some, since a lot of this information, uh, we feel that it's necessary to also publish and, and reveal publicly, so we uh, publish a lot of this on our Twitter account. So with that, thank you for listening. So uh, thank you very much, Robert. Why don't you join me for a moment over here? I know that we're, uh, we're the last thing between uh, the presentations and coffee, so we'll get through this quite quickly. Um, you talked about, you know, you, you talked about really sort of focused on the, on, the, on the attacks, and we know that this is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the, the sort of uh, what's really been going on for many, many years, right back until bef uh, before the, the Russian annexation of Crimea. But overall, it, looking at sort of the specific period from, uh, you know, during wartime after the 24th of February and, and sort of immediate proceeding, how would you sort of evaluate these uh, wartime attacks against Ukraine overall? You've sort of noted a difference in sophistication and in techniques, but overall, what's your sort of kind of evaluation of, of how it's gone? Um, has, it, has it been sort of subject to the same, uh, let's say, sort of lapses in logistical ability and coordination that we've seen on the military scene. Yeah, so it's, it's good news that a lot of these, like in Destroyer 2, uh, a lot of these uh, highly ambitious attacks uh, failed and, and uh, 
the defenders were able to mitigate them also with with our help but definitely they, they did a tremendous job and and were you know prepared for 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 this uh so that's good uh we see, in terms of technically speaking we see both uh sophisticated attacks and 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 less sophisticated attacks so so attacks using off-the-shelf malware uh, attacks that are difficult to attribute because it, it uh, allows them to to stay under the radar and and uh, uh, I guess in some way have uh, plausible deniability. Um, but what I would definitely how I would evaluate it is that we have seen a number in uh, uh, in terms of uh, the numbers there has been a huge spike. So 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 I mean. The numbers of wipers that we've discovered uh, since uh, February 23rd uh, is, is just it's just out of the ordinary. So so we haven't seen such high number of disruptive uh, pieces of malware being used in the past. So there was kind of a shift from the from the espionage and preparation phases to the actual you know sub sabotage attempts. So it's the rise in numbers and the rise in aggressiveness of, of, of their attacks, definitely. So you talked about, you know, the sort of relative sophistication. So Hermetic Wiper, for instance, wasn't particularly sophisticated in its, in its construction, but it sort of obviously was effective. Um, what's, what's your sort of take on the, on, on the whether these groups are sort of um, coordinated or working together. You know, obviously, Sandworm has used lots of different techniques, but we also see activities from Invisimol, from Gamaradon, and so on. And they're sort of perhaps Gamaradon's most most consistently been attacking Ukraine over the years, uh, probably operating out of Crimea. But uh, what's, so, what's your sort of take on the on the sort of coordination between them? Sometimes it seems like they might be stepping on each other's toes a bit and not always coordinating the attacks. Yeah, that's a really good question, and it's really difficult to to you know speculate what might be happening uh, behind the scenes. But exactly, Gamaridon is is the APT group that's been most active in the past couple of years, uh, much more active than than Sandworm. Definitely, Sandworm, on the other hand, is is the one that's been most visible. I would say in terms of uh, high impact. Uh, high impact campaigns, and when you mention uh, Hermetic uh, Wiper, yeah, that was not as as sophisticated compared to, for example, with with Caddy Wiper, which was one of the most uh, advanced uh, wipers uh, that we've seen. For example, it was it was abusing one of the one of the drivers by uh, a legitimate piece of uh, uh, disk partition software. So so their techniques were were. were uh, quite sophisticated, so we, we see we see various levels of, of malware, which could suggest potentially that there are different teams with with different levels of expertise behind these uh, these attacks. Mm -hmm. And you know, in terms of the coordination, is that something that we sort of seen? Typically, we sort of tend to categorize them into different groups. You know, I think we're tracking nine or ten groups in uh, you know sort of active in Russian-speaking languages in that region and in adjacent regions. Um, you know, but is, is it sort of normal to see them working together? Do you think they're being uh, coordinated? Uh, we, I would say it's quite rare, but occasionally we do see indicators of, of them cooperating. A good example of that is, is, is Gamma Redon, for example. So we see uh, them using primarily the Pteroda malware uh, for the early phases of the attacks, for reconnaissance and so on, and then eventually for, for those uh, targets of particular interest, then they would switch to Invisimol, uh, which which uh, prov provides them with uh, with extended functionality uh, to you know to either spy or or to disrupt the the operations of that particular target. Um, so another sort of going to towards Industroyer, and obviously that's the sort of the most like fresh attack, let's say, um, and and great. Great news that you know, along with uh, along with uh, Cert Ukraine guys and you know, Microsoft's interaction, we've seen that um, we were able to really kind of prevent that spreading and, and becoming a very destructive attack. But you know, in, in terms of these types of attacks, uh, is this sort of limited to Ukraine? I mean, it's the same sort of technology. It's used in a lot of power generation stations around the world, not only in in Ukraine, right? Yeah, a lot of these industrial. Uh Hardware is used in in power grids all over the world, um, as, and with Industroyer, the the one of its strong points is its modular framework. So the attackers would would easily be able to uh, to you know, just just 
add other plugins for, for other protocols like Modbus or any other protocol that uh, could be perhaps most wi more widespread or more, more widely used in, in other regions uh, of the world. Uh, so this is definitely something to, to keep an eye out for. Uh, what's interesting is that there are only, only a handful of malware that were specifically targeting uh, industrial systems. Uh, and in the week that that industry that we discovered in Destroyer, uh, there was another one called In Controller, uh, that, according to to public knowledge, has not been actually deployed anywhere. Uh, but that actually goes uh, goes after um, Schneider Electric and and you know uh, PLCs. So so again, some very very alarming potential capability there. So that's that was quite surprising, I would say, to to in one week since we have including these two, uh, only about seven, I think, pieces of malware that are targeting industrial, industrial systems to discover two in the same week. So that, that was very interesting in, in, yeah. in, in, in our field. Yeah, and we talked, to, you know, you sort of said that we've sort of seen uh, since the, since the uh, invasion on 24th and you know, right before with Hermetic, we've seen this incredible spike in the number of wipers and the differences in sophistication. But you also mentioned something quite interesting that about the time, the, the, the preparation. You know, so we have to remember that, you know, anyone who's involved in software, you, can't, you don't write this stuff overnight. It yep. doesn't just happen. So even the final compile date, Clearly, there's been testing, there's been evaluation, Q&A, the whole business behind actually creating the software, finding the vulnerabilities, and then uh, testing and deploying. Have we really been able to see sort of any of that sort of testing phase going back and where you sort of see, or are they kind of doing that live iteration so the wipers kind of have a lot of the same components that we then see redeployed? Um, well, they, they're, I guess they were forced to come, come out with uh, these different versions because we continue to detect uh, all of them. So they're, they're trying to you know, uh, slip by undetected. Uh, fortunately, um, not very successful at that. So they're trying various, you know, various versions, various uh, variants. And uh, yeah, they, they, they need to test them, of course. But again, this is speculation, but we can, we can you know, discuss about how, how good they are in, in preparing for these attacks. Uh, for example, as 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 evidenced by uh, some of the programming errors in in the first version of Industry, for example, uh, they most likely relied on some some emulators of these industrial protocols, and I mean the impact of the malware is really depends on what's on the other side. What are those devices? What's the environment like? Uh, and that actually depends on what 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 will be the effect, and that's that's really hard to you know. I mean. Uh, the attackers, um, typical, typically attackers don't have a power plan at their disposal and, you know, to be able to test these things beforehand. And that's probably also part of the reason why, why they sort of had that redundancy of all those four different uh, communication protocols in place. Um, in Industry 2, they did fix some mistakes. Uh, but again, that didn't help them much, so it didn't accomplish even that. So, so yeah, it's uh, good news that defenders are are better prepared all the time. Yeah, I mean, sort of um, in terms of the sort of deployment. Clearly, it was really well planned. It was a hermetic wiper, and then one, one you know, obviously didn't have time to mention everything. But as soon as we saw the certificate revocation uh, of um, of uh, hermetic wiper, they deployed Isaac wiper yep. kind of immediately. So, and Isaac wiper had even older compile dates and even older certificates and so on. So, I guess there was a lot of pre pre planning in, into this. And so, in, given that there was there was obviously a pre plan, there was some coordination, they had some known dates, they have a timing for deployment. What kind of surprised you the most in the end about you know, some of these wipers or what surprised you the most about Industroyer 2? With Industroyer 2, um, when, when we found it, I would say the most surprising thing was that we, we only found it the first, uh, we only saw it the first time after over five years that was not deployed um, before, earlier. Uh, so that was actually like one of the one of the mo most puzzling things about it. Like there were there were also uh, in in the industry very speculation that whether whether it was the industry was a test uh, of some sorts of like w and and considering uh, the large contrast between between uh, the attempted impact and what it actually caused and you know the, the capability of the malware and and and, and its effect. 
Um, it was it was actually surprising that we didn't see it again until now. So apparently they were they were keeping it, you know, uh, ready for use at, at at a specific time. Great, Robert. Thank you very much for your uh, for the presentation. Thank you for the you know great answers to the questions. Okay, so my name is Juraj Janosik. Uh, I'm a leader of a team uh, in ESET who is responsible for automated uh, threat detection and uh, incorporating of machine learning uh, technologies in the, uh, in the product portfolio and as well uh, into the uh, backend infrastructure. So let me start uh, with uh, a bit of terminology. Uh, first of all, uh, the terms uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning are often wrongly, uh, I would say, used interchangeably. I do it myself. I hate, hate myself for that. Uh, I do it as well. So, but in, in ESET, uh, we under artificial intelligence really understand uh, the more general concept. Uh, when intelligent machine can learn and make decisions absolutely independently and autonomously, uh, based on the inputs from uh, the environment, and actually act without any human supervision. But actually, this is something that doesn't doesn't exist really right now, right? Uh, it's more from uh, something from sci-fi sci movies. Uh, however, what do, what is used uh, right now is the machine learning, uh, the field of computer science uh, that gives. Uh, that gives machines the ability to find uh, patterns in the vast amount uh, of data. So, um, someone uh, in the uh, in the field uh, of artificial intelligence and machine learning would say that uh, the true distinction between these two things is uh, is what he said in this joke that really when something is written in Python, then it's machine learning, and when it's in PowerPoint, then it's definitely an AI. Uh, so. Where the idea uh, comes from? It's from 1950s, uh, where the first uh, uh, mathematical background for the uh, what we what we used to call right now uh, neural networks uh, originate from. Then uh, in 2000s, still the machine learning really looked like this. It was more of a mathematics uh, that was really need to deep dive to understand it. All the tools available for the uh, for the engineers were only only starting, and when you want to uh, when you want to use it uh, in your product, you really uh, need to uh, work hard uh, uh, in order to to use it. Uh, later or nowadays, uh, deploying the machine learning model and and do machine learning is like really simple. Uh, the tools that are available from the big companies like Microsoft or, or Google are actually allowing anybody without any background knowledge of machine learning, sci uh, scientific, uh, mathematics models, anything, uh, do it for whatever purpose. Uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence kind of uh, is everywhere around us, uh, impacting, influencing, uh, improving our lives and society every day. Uh, there is many diff different different areas of uh, scientific research and progress where uh, where the machine learning is used right now, and it's really hard to keep uh, really hard to keep up uh, with this uh, real progress. And everybody have um, uh, machine machine learning algorithms right now with him uh, carrying on in the in the mobile phone and. Uh, Many of these uses that we never know about, wherever it is, uh, it's, uh, sometimes, uh, it's sometimes very important for our lives. And uh, there is also no limitations on the bad actors using these, uh, these tools today. And likely, uh, utilizing them uh, also in the future will be uh, much more. But uh, in the realm of cybersecurity, uh, the situation is a little bit more complicated. Uh, some of the post-truth uh, cybersecurity vendors, as we, as we like to call them, or these ne next-gen companies, uh, present machine learning as, as some kind of silver bullet to all the cybersecurity-related issues. And uh, they usually start with, uh, uh, with their marketing materials with a lot of uh, preposterous claims like, ah, oh, you don't need to unpack any binary, uh, you don't need to deobfuscate, uh, emulate samples, or anything like that. Just by doing some machine learning, you will, you will easily 
uh, easily said that something is malicious or clean without any problems. Uh, well, we dare oppose to these claims. Uh, we think that uh, our expertise, which is more than 30 years in the cybersecurity, is proving that there are any unicorns uh, in, the, in the machine learning, and that regular updates accompanied with uh, other cybersecurity techniques is what is needed in order to provide something that could be really called an exigen security. So how it is, uh, how it is in ESET? What is our approach in this? Well, quickly, look, quickly looking at the, uh, at the historical and technological stack of ESET, uh, from the early days of the company, more than 30 years ago, we already tried to accompany it in the time when it was really hard, uh, all, these, all these new, uh, new approaches like neural networks in our product and also in our research. And in 1998, uh, we, already have, uh, we already have the neural network as a part of our, uh, part of, part of our endpoint, endpoint scanner. So it was much more before any, anybody was claiming any, any next-gen uh, approach. Then, uh, in 2005, we came up with uh, something which we call DNA detections, which is in current terms something called online machine learning. I will mention it later because it's really important for uh, what we are doing uh, right now. Uh, then, during those times when the, the rise of the samples that we, that we saw in the wild was, uh, was, from, uh, was, was from few thousand going up to the hundreds of thousands every day, uh, you need to find really smartly and clever ideas of how to deal with that. Uh, we start to use a lot of uh, clustering algorithms and all these things on the back end and also machine learning approaches to help alleviate our uh, detection and research stuff and uh, really focus on the interesting things from the vastly amount. And then later in the 2017, we start with the deployment and uh, deployment of a uh, module which was uh, specifically uh, designed using all the machine learning technologies that were available that we think that are actually fine to use uh, in the, in the uh, scanner on the endpoints and it's deployed on every, every endpoint that we have. So uh, why we do that? Basically, from the beginning of the ESET, when, the, when ESET was a garage company, actually, uh, we had the approach the cybersecurity. Uh, we need to approach the cybersecurity smartly, smartly rather than uh, rather than brute force, because we don't have so much employees that uh, other veterans on the on the market already have. So uh, it was this kind of environment that pushes us toward uh, smart automation and machine learning although it was not called that uh, in the times, and forced us to develop clever approach, collect data, uh, and pick the important, uh, important data, and finding the needle in the haystack, actually. So years ago, uh, the limitations in utilizing machine learning uh, algorithms has been the huge cost of specific hardware and load, load on the software engineers. That was, that was like the main main problem. But in recent years, with the inception of uh, big data and the drop of the cost of specific hardware, the GPUs, that was the crucial thing uh, when the rapid uh, adoption of, ma of machine learning started. For us, this was, uh, this was great because it helped us to improve the things that we already have and uh, build, uh, build inside of our lab. Uh, machine learning itself are on the rise right now still. Academic papers describing new approaches are going out every day. And uh, innovative ways on the machine learning are, are emerging also every day. And uh, frameworks like TensorFlow or Scikit-Learn or Azure, uh, they're available to every developer. For us, that's a good opportunity. We, we can, we can uh, check all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of algorithms, try it on our data, and see what works and what works not. Um, and last but not least, the important thing uh, when you are considering to build any machine learning solution or support your solution with machine learning uh, is the data and uh, to have the understanding of the data. Our database consists of hundreds of terabytes of samples, but not only the amount is the important thing. The important thing is that you understand the data, you have metadata co uh, collected uh, and associated with them, you have the intelligence from the people which are working on the research analysis, and this is all together 
what will help you to train and actually build a model that is useful and could be well performing. Uh, however, as I mentioned before, this kind of post-truth security vendors uh, present machine learning technology as, uh, as a kind of a myth, like a silver bullet uh, and, uh, that could solve everything. And uh, basically, this is, this, is, this is not true. And uh, not even the newest machine learning algorithm solely itself wouldn't solve, uh, wouldn't solve the cybersecurity. And why this so? Uh, well, they usually claim that you can, you can decide whether some kind of sample or binary is a malware without running itself, just by doing math, right? However, this, this, this was opposed with the famous, uh, famous mathematician and crypto analyst uh, Alan Turing uh, during the Second World War and he, when he cracked down uh, the Nazi Enigma code that this isn't possible. Even a flawless machine wouldn't always be able to decide whether future unknown input wouldn't lead to unwanted behavior. What this means is that uh, also uh, you can end up in an indefinite loop. For machine learning, this means that just by doing this, you are not able to decide on whether any input could lead, uh, lead to, something, uh, to something bad without running it. Uh, other claim that is really popular uh, is that machine learning is not enough, right? So let's do deep learning, because that's better. But again, that's this, this the same, repeating the same mistake. Like, you are not relying on some older machine learning algorithm, but you are using deep learning. It's still the same. Uh, it's, still the, it's still the same fallacy. Uh, also, in order to use uh, machine learning effect effectively, uh, a lot of samples is needed. Uh, if you want to do a classification algorithm, uh, you need to have a lot of data. But uh, it's not only about the amount of data, but in order to train a model that will be performing well, uh, you need to have a right balance in your data sets. You need to, you need, you need to have a data set that is, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that, is, that is labeled in the correct way, so you know what is clean, what is malicious in, uh, in the cybersec. So either way, you end up in the, in the, with, the, with the buggy model, which is not able to predict what is actually happening. This is something that, that is... Uh, common thing and common mistake in a lot of academic papers. Like uh, the academia is trying to use those approaches in the cybersec and they always end up with, uh, uh, with models which are not performing well because they don't have the data and uh, they lack the domain knowledge, like the understanding of the thread landscape. And this is actually true also for a lot of vendors. Uh, another thing is that the, the, the adversary here is intelligent. Uh, on, a, on one hand, uh, you can see that a lot of companies are presenting that, well, the machine learning and artificial intelligence is, is great uh, because it could beat people in chess or Go or whatever. But think about it. The thing is that these games have some rules. And, this, uh, and the machine learning could learn that there are some boundaries which are described by this rule. rule. But um, in cybersecurity, in this complex environment, there are no rules. The, the, the adversaries and the bad guys could do whatever, whatever they want and completely change the entire, entire play, playing field. So in this environment, uh, the machine learning has its limits. Uh, obviously, from the picture, you can see that this is a false positive, right? And uh, cyber criminals are known to work hard to avoid uh, detection. They use their skills to hide the true purpose of their code uh, by covering it with obfuscation and encryption and so on. And so, on. so while understanding, uh, right, uh, while missing a malicious sample pose a problem, also false positives pose a, pose a problem. Uh, with Generally, with machine learning algorithms and machine learning models, uh, the number of false positives is higher. And uh, what it usually, uh, what it usually uh, is taken as a countermeasure uh, with regular administrators is that either they keep the, uh, keep the setting strict and the daily, daily work could be like more painful and a lot of FPs are coming out, so there is a lot of work and you need to 
take care of it, or you can lose the protective setup, which can reduce the detection, but also uh, the capability of detection and pro potentially create uh, new vulnerabilities. And as in, as in real life, uh, when you think that you are pregnant, uh, you at least double check or ask for second opinion from a professional, right? So here is the same. Like there is, uh, there is already numerous white papers well uh, describing uh, attack techniques on common machine learning algorithms. Um, this is why our design that we uh, that we came up uh, is a combination of various algorithms, various approaches of machine learning. But not only that, uh, still the the presence of the human's expertise is absolutely crucial. So how would this work uh, in our? Uh, multi-layered protection, as we call it. So this is, uh, this is a, a description of various uh, technologies that we have um, uh, present on every endpoint to protect it. Uh, those in the yellow square uh, are technologies which are especially dedicated and uh, are involve involved uh, or using the machine learning technologies. Uh, and uh, they are communicating with each, with each other and supporting the other parts of it. So, but these three are the, uh, the, the main holders of the machine learning uh, capabilities. So how it works. Um, I will quickly go through it. I don't want to go much into detail, but it's, uh, that is important. So formerly, uh, those AV signatures that, uh, that uh, these next-gen uh, vendors are are uh, hate so much. Uh, we never use that. Uh, we have this uh, unique technology where we uh, basically uh, transform the full sample into the form which is more amenable or more suitable for com or comparing and, and detection. And we call it DNA. So for every, every sample, we create this DNA. And uh, by precisely selecting uh, parts of the DNA, these, these genes, uh, as we call them, we create something which is called DNA detection. This DNA detection could be could be automatic or could be created by human uh, human detection engineers. And we have this technology since 2005. So this was much more before, again, uh, than anybody was claiming that this is some next gen. And why this is uh, why this is. Uh, uh, kind of a machine learning approach. It's because this, this DNA detection is not static. It's kind of, to make it simple, it's a kind of algorithm that is deployed and, uh, to every client. And uh, together, it creates a, a model which is able to find new variants and, uh, and a, a kind of adapt to, uh, to new, uh, to new uh, samples. And so how it works? This is a this is a graph uh, which shows uh, Qbots detection in uh, some specific period between 2019 and 2020, 2021. Uh, so the green turquoise uh, turquoise graph uh, represents all the unique detections, and uh, the pink one or the uh, present one specific DNA detection that was created somewhere around 2019 and was still this day still able to cover a lot of these new variants. So that's how this system is effective, still today. Uh, but maybe you will say, OK, so uh, this is some your data. Maybe something uh, much more better will be, uh, will be uh, the way how to prove it. So thanks to the, uh, thanks to the uh, Conti leak that happened right after uh, the uh, the war in Ukraine started, we have been able to look from the other side how this is effective. This is actually the graph that represents uh, the tree bot detection during the 20 and 20 uh, during the summer 2020. And what we found in the communication that was leaked from the Conti is that the guys have a really problem to overcome this detection. They mentioned it specifically, and they said that uh, others that are not that scary. Uh, before in the communication, they were referring to other antivirus companies. Uh, so based on that, uh, based on these DNA detection, uh, we built later something which uh, 
is really using a lot of currently available machine learning algorithms, is combining like classical approaches, support vector machines, um, uh, tree algorithms, uh, boosted trees algorithms, and so on, uh, so on, with deep learning, neural networks, transformers, and so on. Uh, so the input is those DNA genes that I, I showed before. Uh, they are run through all these models. At the end, uh, there is a one neural network which uh, stands for a consolidation. So there will be one output which, is, which will set or give us the clue uh, to, the, uh, to the scanner or to the guys in the, in the lab, whether something is with some probability malicious or clean. So this is, this is what we do. Uh, also, in the, uh, this approach is on every endpoint. This model is trained and is deployed on every endpoint. That's, that's really important to say, because uh, this is not residing, not residing in the cloud. Uh, it was really hard to do that because uh, you need to uh, you need to think about the performance, about the size, because it will be on the devices, uh, mobile phones, uh, notebooks, laptops, everything. So this needs to be taken in consideration when creating such a model. But of course, we have models which are much more bigger. So uh, in order to do, do uh, use those, we they are residing in the cloud, and on the request from the client, they are they are used. And not only that, because as I said before, the machine learning is not enough. Solely. So uh, in cloud, we have much more powerful technologies like uh, advanced unpacking, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is used uh, on the request from the, from the client when we spot some uh, complicated, uh, complicated protector or packer, which couldn't be overcome uh, on the sandbox, which is on the machine. So we hand it over to the, cl uh, to the cloud and process it there. Also, uh, there are much more bigger models which couldn't be fed uh, into, into the endpoint. And also, uh, there is a huge part which, which stands for our uh, cloud sandbox, which is actually uh, real machines uh, which are executing the stuff and we are monitoring what is happening inside. So, and finally, the answer back to the endpoint could be synchronously or asynchronously uh, whether the thing is malicious or clean. And the endpoint could de then decide what to do with that. This approach is, whether I mentioned before, uh, was mainly uh, was mainly supervised. Supervised machine, machine learning means that before you have a you have a train set which is correct, which is labeled, so clean clean samples, malicious samples, and you are trying to train model which could distinguish between those. Uh, also, there are other approaches in machine learning, like unsupervised learning, when you don't uh, when, when you let the algorithm to learn uh, uh, these things on its own. And uh, we were thinking, like, how can we use it? Um, it's obviously something that will cause a lot of FPs. Uh, so we find other, uh, other places when it will actually help us. And that's uh, UFI detection. So we have a, a unique UFI uh, scanner, which is uh, incorporated in every, every other endpoint. And uh, from th those, we get a lot of UFI samples. It's a millions uh, every, every month. So it's basically not able to process by humans. But uh, what we can do is that we start to classify, uh, cluster, cluster it uh, and use the unsupervised learning techniques to, uh, to find the outliers. And those outliers are then, uh, then hand over to uh, human researchers. This is kind of like early warning system. And it actually works. Uh, it helps us to find uh, the first, log uh, first UFI rootkit logex, and also uh, thanks to this automatic, uh, automated approach, uh, and uh, well, we have been able to uncover a lot of UFI uh, firmware backdoors and other additional vulnerabilities, and work with uh, major hardware suppliers to fix them. Okay, uh, what it's uh, for us as machine learning engineers, a uh, really huge playing field. Uh, for a lot of a uh, uh, lot of machine learning algorithms, is the EDR and XDR environment. Uh, the bunch of improvements that could be done there, there is uh, is obviously huge. Uh, the environment is much more complex than just the regular regular endpoint because we are looking on the whole network and. Uh, the, the, the ideas come from itself, right? There is anomaly detection that could be used. Uh, there is uh, baselining, so you learn what's the user, what's the sound, standard user behavior, on, uh, or or uh, what's the standard behavior in in their environment. 
And based on that, you can look on the deviations, what happens, and this could pose, again, uh, as some kind of early warning system. Sequential processing of events in time, because this is happening uh, 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 in in like some time a uh, kind of time series because uh, when you are evaluating things on the endpoint this is usually something static like a sample so but this is much more much more different so uh, also classification methods could be used here uh, like typically those that we use on the endpoint but it's much more complex uh, because uh, you know the EDR and XDR uh, uh, environment uh, pose a lot of challenges. Uh, there is much more, much more data, and uh, the amount of alarms or incidents that you can uh, throw against, uh, throw against uh, administrator personnel is much more, much more higher. And uh, if, you, if your company don't have uh, like a specific security staff or SOC, uh, the, the amount of work that needs to be done to handle such, uh, such uh, EDR could be tremendous. But uh, that's where the machine learning could help. But still, there are some kind of limitations. OK, so uh, let's continue. Let's continue. So this is, this is our like, complete design, what we have, the center. Uh, is the uh, is the endpoint with all the protection layers? Then we have the asset inspect, which is uh, which is our EDR. Again, we are trying to incorporate uh, some machine learning technologies. Already, some some of them are there. Uh, but again, uh, just just simply uh, doing machine learning or putting it everywhere is not enough. Uh, again, uh, when you look uh, when you look uh, up. What, what we value the most and what is still important here is that uh, is, the, is the part of the human expertise. That's, that's the key. Okay, but uh, there, that, this, this, this sounds like machine learning is here only for the defenders, but the thing actually is that uh, why also adversaries couldn't use it, right? So there are many ways how cyber attackers can utilize the machine learning uh, based technologies on their own benefit. So let's look what, uh, what are the areas. So obviously what is already happening right now, uh, and not, no machine learning needs to be there, uh, is creating a new malware. Uh, reinventing and improving previously uh, by automation, generating new variants from the older variants. This is all happening right now. But with, uh, we think and we anticipate that with uh, more adoption of machine learning uh, in these processes which bad guys are doing, uh, the rise and the amount of the new and better, actually, uh, malware would be, would be going up. Also creating a, a malicious spam. Like years before, the spam was usually a lot of clumsy, especially, especially in the local languages. But right now, thanks to, the, um, thanks to the improvements of translation algorithms and NLP processing, uh, also the spam improves. And you don't, need to be, uh, you don't need to speak the language in order to create uh, a phishing or, or spam that will be in perfect, uh, perfect language uh, shape. Uh, this is again already happening right now, and we anticipate that it will be it will be much more. Also, uh, one of the things that uh, we are using machine learning to protect ourselves, right? Why though? Why also the bad guys couldn't do that? Uh, they could they could introduce. Uh, they could introduce these mechanisms to find a better ways how to spot that uh, somebody is trying to um, trying to deploy uh, a honeypot and, and or research how the uh, botnet is operating. So they could uh, do a countermeasures. Also, they could identify like red flags that could give uh, give away the uh, uh, malware's intentions and also improve the self-destruct mechanism, or, uh, as we, or uh, uh, mimic the patterns uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the regular and clean uh, uh, traffic in order to hide the malicious traffic. So uh, we already thought that we spot something like that in the MLTF, and it was, it was complicated to track, it was complicated uh, to uh, to communicate with the CNC and get all the all the stuff when when we were doing the research, 
uh, it was more of a like a cat and mouse game uh, during the botnet tracking. And we actually believe that those people behind the emoted was already using some machine learning algorithms to pick the targets and, uh, and the operators behind uh, were using these techniques. But as you can see, uh, when the Ukrainian police uh, busted those operators, this was actually uh, how their infrastructure looked like. So not much machine learning right there. Uh, but well, still, emoted is back. Uh, it's uh, it's pretty pretty nasty malware, so maybe uh, this time they will do, do better. Uh, also, uh, where machine learning in future uh, in this uh, in this area will have uh, might 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 support the increase of the speed of the attack, uh, which can be crucial, especially in cases uh, as as data theft. So. Uh, if you have an algorithm, if the bad guys could uh, could come up with an algorithm that could perform the extraction of targeted data, find the, find the right data which could be which should be extracted, this uh, this will be something which will be hard to overcome, which will be hard to uh, hard to prevent, and uh, again speed up speed up of the of the uh, exfiltration of the data might uh, might prevent uh, prevent us from detecting or maybe may, may making it harder to detect. Uh, and as I mentioned before, like in the in the emoted case, they were already trying to uh, already trying to target uh, the ad additional modules on the specific specific people by collecting the telemetry and evaluating the telemetry. But again, if you harvest a lot of telemetry, then uh, with all these uh, well, with the adoption of the machine learning, you can do that better. Uh, one thing that is already happening. Uh, with the assistance of machine learning is uh, finding of the new zero-day vulnerabilities. So um, this technique is called fuzzing. So it's it's like providing the algorithm with the uh, with the invalid, unexpected, or basically a random input, and we are trying to trying to figure out what works and what could uh, what could uh, uh, lead to a unpredicted behavior and hence you can identify a zero day or basically an exploit this is something which is really uh, valuable and precious for the for the attackers and uh, currently for like the good good use the fuzzing uh, is equipped or being equipped with the machine learning to speed this process up. So there is no way why in future or recent years uh, the bad guys will also not do that, right? So when we look uh, what Microsoft and Google is doing right now, uh, Google actually claims that uh, in 2019 there have been able, thanks to the uh, to the fuzzing with the, uh, equipped with the machine learning, find more than 20,000. Uh, vulnerabilities in their environment. So the tools are there. You just you just need to use them. Uh, other realm, which has been from the start riddled with trouble, uh, is the IoT. So the number of the devices, such as routers, security cameras, uh, various sensors, uh, is growing extremely fast. And however, the security is notoriously uh, lacking and uh, known to being susceptible to most uh, most primitive exploitation techniques, uh, such as brute force of defa default uh, default credentials and misuse of uh, years old vulnerabilities. So all of these things uh, uh, will probably get much more worse uh, because. As I said before, the uh, the fuzzing uh, here will be much more faster thanks to the machine learning. In IoT, uh, the device is much more simpler, so you don't need to uh, don't need to process so much code. Uh, and with the clever automation, you can uh, you can find uh, new zero days extremely quickly. And uh, IoT devices generally present an ideal platform for. Uh, amazing uh, large quantities uh, of legitimate traffic information and user habits, uh, which can uh, which can be used and trained uh, machine learning models uh, designs to uh, to st uh, stealth or make the make make the uh, uh, malicious activity invisible. So, uh, but not all the outlooks uh, here are so grim. Uh, actually, it seems that the bright future is already here. Uh, according to the 
uh, Consumer Technology Association, four years back, more than half of all application of uh, machine learning has been actually used to improve the security. So that's, that's kind of uh, interesting. The other thing is that how many of those, uh, how many of those applications were actually, uh, actually good. Uh, and uh, other research organization, Meticulous, uh, uh, is anticipating that at the end of the decade, uh, the field of cybersecurity alone, uh, the machine learning part of it, uh, will be uh, worth more than $60 billion. So surely uh, this is a huge uh, financial gain. Uh, maybe also there will be some security value, right? Uh, but uh, we need to be vigilant. Uh, we need to question what, uh, what the vendors are saying to us uh, if they really understand the limitations of the machine learning. You might be said that, okay, I'm standing here, I'm principal machine learning something, uh, but uh, I'm more of a, and I should be maybe an advocate of the machine learning, but I'm more of a uh, machine learning realist than machine learning uh, utopist. And I'm aware that there is a lot of limitations and we need to think twice uh, where to use machine learning, how to use it. We need to understand the limitations and questions there use. So thank you very much. So thank you, Uri. Uh, just join me for a couple of questions. So uh, really like an uh, interesting, uh, interesting talk and I, I think a uh, fresh kind of take on some of, the, uh, some of the things that we hear about and I think many, many people will obviously have heard about AI and talking about uh, AI, but it's nice to hear what it, what it really means. But I think it is a very important consideration to understand what the, the, the limitations really are of that. So you mentioned, in the, um, you mentioned in the talk that there are some challenges in applying AI to EDR specifically or XDR. So what do you mean by you know, this uh, specific challenges in this case? Uh, in the XDR environment, the, the challenges mainly are about the amount of the data. Uh, when you imagine that uh, in, order to, in order to provide a good, uh, uh, good estimate of uh, what is happening on the machine, you need to monitor uh, all the events and uh, boils down to like tens, uh, tens events per second from one machine. So if you imagine a company with tens of thousands of endpoints, that is a huge amount, it's, it's, and it's in the real time. So that's the difference from the endpoint where you just have one sample and you can do dynamic static analysis, whatever. But, uh, but in XDR and EDR, these uh, things are happening in the real time. So that's one of the challenges. And second, uh, maybe more important, is the privacy, because uh, when you are looking on the sample, well, that's just the sample. But in the in the XDR, you are looking on the whole network. You are you are processing uh, the network traffic, everything that could be passwords, that could be some personal things. So uh, the trust between the vendor and the client needs to go much much higher. So this is these are the main. Challenges. Yeah, and that that kind of leads into uh, so my second question is that you know wait. As a vendor, you know, talk about that trust relationship, but we're obviously handling huge amounts of, of data to train the systems, to, to look at them, and it's, you know, inevitably some of that data, if it was misused, could be linked back to, uh, to, to, to sort of expose privacy of, or expo expose personal information and so on. So uh, how do you sort of solve the security side of that? What are the things that we would put in place to make sure that the, 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 that privacy thing doesn't happen that you're talking about? Yes, yes, uh, you mentioned it. So we are a security vendor, so the trust between us and the client is absolutely crucial. Uh, so all the data they are mention that are mentioned uh, for uh, the training are, uh, are securely stored, they are encrypted, uh, all the communication between uh, the endpoints protected with the set and the backend is, is encrypted. Uh, all the data are stored on our servers, so we are not using any Azure, uh, Amazon, whatever. It's uh, everything. It's our hardware in our data centers, and uh, also the people which are uh, which are allowed to work with them are um, are going through uh, several uh, you know trainings. And uh, not everybody in ESET actually have access to it. Also, not everybody in the virus lab has access to it. And uh, we never never sell any data to third parties, and uh, we never share any data with the first parties. Uh, 
except uh, the uh, the law enforcement when we do any any kind of investigation. So that's that's the only exception. Yeah. So um, in terms of the sort of uh, the, the sort of the way it works, you know, obviously we've got that data. We're, we're we're securing it. We're making sure that we're, you know, we're not exposing that uh, to to anything. But then you also sort of need need to use it, um, and it's a huge amount of data. You mentioned you know, hundreds of terabytes. So compared to sort of other machine learning models like GPT, how big would be the models that you're actually talking about? Okay, so <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Uh, well. The GPT, I don't know if you are familiar with that, that's uh, a natural language processing model, famous one uh, from Google. Uh, and it's huge. It's based on, it's based on neural networks and deep learning. Uh, we, we kind of use the same, uh, same approach for, uh, for processing of sequential data, by the way. Uh, but uh, the GPT is enormous in the number of parameters. That's, that's, that's the kind of... Uh, that's the kind of metric which is used in the in the machine learning. So it's uh, in the matter of billions, like three or four billions. Our models, like in the in the scale of, of hundreds of thousands of uh, of these uh, of these uh, features, which is obviously much more less. But uh, size doesn't matter here, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, because uh, it's about what the model can do. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that when you have a huge model, it's a good model. That doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the other thing that you know, just to talk about briefly, you know, we, we we used to talk about heuristics and behavior analysis. So how does machine learning kind of factor into behavior analysis? Are they the same thing? Is there, what are sort of differences? And does the sort of the machine learning aspect of it behave? Uh, sorry, uh, kind of support the behavioral analysis that that we are doing? Yes, it does. Uh, we do that. Uh, so for example, kind of the behavioral analysis is. Uh, also happening on our endpoint, so it's, it's running the sample in, in in a small in a small sandbox, and one of the output is uh, is like the stream of uh, uh, of what actually what actually happened during the during the execution, and we fed this to a sequential processing model. That's that's the model which is similar to what Google is using for the natural language processing. We are using basically the same approach, but the, distingu the, the, the distinction is that. Uh, we need to completely recode it because we couldn't use basically the same. Uh, the Google model is uh, uh, is used for natural language. Uh, we use it for uh, API calls and so on, and uh, and also the size. Uh, the, si the, the size matters here because uh, you need to have it as much smaller. Yeah, that's, that's weird, but we want to have it smaller because you are deploying it on the mobile phones. You are deploying on the on the on the Endpoints and uh, the performance impact is something that we really care about a lot. So, smaller model but uh, with good performance. That that's that's our key here. So great, thank thank you very much. I, I have one final question: Are you at all like worried about uh, the future of cybersecurity? That you know, uh, an AI might replace you in your job. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't think that will, this will happen in my lifetime. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Thank you for sticking here with me. I know it has been a long day, a lot of information to take in. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today here is going to be the thread landscape, as we call it. I don't see my presentation still on the slides. <laughs> so I guess we have to wait for the director to say it's up there. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is the threats as we see them in our data. So we are going, I'm going to actually wrap up the whole day because I'm going to reference to almost every speaker that talked today. Uh, and I'm going to base everything on the data that we have in our thread report. So that's a, every four months we Pick, take all the data and crunch it and do a nice report, wrap it in nice graphics and provide all the information, all the intelligence that we can publicly make available to everybody. Uh, and in this thread report, we have a lot of categories, data, APT reports. So I'm going to go through some of those interesting points so that you have an idea what you can find there. And maybe I will inspire to go to our website, Willip Security and download the copy for, you, for yourself. 
My name is Andre Kubovic, as already said by Andy, and I work in Virus Lab as a security awareness specialist. That means I'm trying to translate everything that our guys are doing from the technical into the human realm. So, so it's more understandable for everybody. So let's dive in right in, into how the report looks. This is like the overview of all the categories that we have there. And I'm going to start with the APT group activity because this is a section where we are always reporting on the latest findings of uh, our threat analysts who are monitoring specific groups. And the one that I'm going to show you, first one that I'm going to show you is Oilrig. Oilrig is a well-known uh, threat actor. They, I need to use my cheat sheet again, APT33, uh, Lysium or Siamese Kitten, that's all the names that the cybersecurity industry is using. That's a very good use from our side that we, <laughs> we have always 10 names for each group. So it's easy to uh, orientate you, yourself. And uh, they have been active since 2014. They are believed to be based in Iran and they are targeting uh, victims around uh, the Middle East, so different countries in Middle East. One um, very recent campaign that they were involved in uh, was called Out to Sea. It's really small down there. Uh, and they have been using different backdoors to run the campaign. Mostly it was the Denbot, but what I'm going to uh, talk about is mostly the last one, the one in purple called Marlin. And Marlin was uh, different to all of the previous backdoors because it changed the way it communicated with the attackers, with the CNC, with the servers. Uh, it switched from DNS and HTTP and HTTPS to uh, using a OneDrive API. So a different way how to connect to the servers and ask for the commands from the owners or the, the operators of the malware. What they were targeting mostly were uh, victims in these three areas, so medical, technology, and diplomatic organizations. And it was in Israel, Tunisia, and United Arab Emirates. Uh, how they were doing it, mostly they were trying to infect the victim through spear phishing. And if they were able to get inside, so they persuaded the victim to click on something, they would download and install some uh, remote access tool, typically TeamViewer, very popular tool in the, not just in the security industry, but also in the IT as a whole. And when they have that access, then they can do all sort of havoc in the network. So what I mean by that, they are looking for sensitive data. So it can be passwords or credentials that are stored in Chrome because they have a tool to dump those passwords. They were using Mimikatz to hunt for passwords. Key logging, because they were also trying to look at what the victim was typing. And also, when they were already able to get into some systems, they were looking for sensitive, interesting data that they could exfiltrate. And if, of course, when you are already in the network, why wouldn't you look around and find something more interesting that you could steal, you could actually use for your own good? So lateral movement to do this, to like move in the network, they used a tool, uh, SMB tool, that was based on the Eternal Blue exploit, which is a known NSA tool that has been leaked to the internet and used, for example, in the WannaCry infection in 2017. Another APT group that we have been reporting on uh, in our report, in the thread report in the last year, were the Dukes. Again, a very well-known group. If it doesn't ring a bell for you, then maybe APT29, Cozy Bear, Nobelium, some of those names might work. And if it still doesn't work, maybe the attack on the DNC in the United States or uh, attacks connected to the solar winds compromise, all of those were done by the Dukes, so they are quite known in the industry as well as by the victims, I guess. In T2, we have seen a spear phishing campaign. They are really good in social engineering. Uh, they were pretending to be from a Belgian uh, embassy, saying that the embassy is closing, not stating which country or whatever, like closer information. But if you want the closer information, then you have to go to the attached HTML file. Of course, the HTML file is not just a benign thing where you get some information, but it also contains an, uh, it will download an ISO file. This is a disk, uh, disk image file. And in the end, you will get infected by one of the, uh, it, it contains like three different files, one DLL, one LNK, and one decoy document. You were looking for information, so there's a decoy document where you don't get much information, but still it looks legitimate to you. But in the back, in the, back uh, the DLL is run and Cobalt Strike is installed. Uh, this is a, if you don't know what it is, it's a red team 
tool. So pen testers are using this to get inside networks they are testing, they're, they want to uh, penetrate. Uh, and it's a go-to tool for the Dukes. So they really like this, and they like to use it to get into the networks of their victims. That was in T2. Uh, if you don't know what T stands for, it's January till April, May till uh, August, and September till December. So it's, we have always this four-month period. So T3, that's the last four months of 2021. Another campaign that was run by the Dukes. This time they were pretending to be from uh, Iran, Iranian embassy, and saying that due to COVID infections, they have to close the embassy. Again, additional information is in the attached HTML, so similar tactics. Uh, again, this time there was this uh, ISO disk file, but in the end, not a uh, DLL or LNK was downloaded, by, but a COVID.HTA file was uh, uh, downloaded and then run. This is a file that can contain JavaScript or it can contain power, uh, sorry, JavaScript or VBS script, sorry. And in the end, it would run a PowerShell, PowerShell script and install, again, Cobalt Strike. Uh, as we have seen more of these emails, this is just one example, there were different payloads they were trying to use. Even the ISO file doesn't have to be always ISO. Sometimes they use different file types that are also used as disk images, so VHDX. Uh, and then in the end, it will always end by the Cobalt Strike infection. So that was the second campaign. Oh, also, the APT groups like to look at the news. Because in the news, sometimes you can find very interesting information. For example, you can see uh, what the new vulnerabilities have been found. And sometimes they even find the vulnerabilities before everybody else and start using them. And based on that, we will have to patch something. That was exactly the case for proxy logon. Probably most of you uh, who work in IT have heard this name. Proxy logon is a chain of vulnerabilities uh, in MS Exchange servers. You can use it, if you use it right, to con take complete control over the MS Exchange, install malware, uh, sniff on the traffic or emails that are being sent, or use it for sending other emails. So it gives you complete control, which is quite interesting in, in an organization where most of the information is flowing through MS Exchange through the emails, actually. Uh, the information or the number that the media have been inf uh, reporting was that around 60,000 victims were around the world. Of course, our telemetry is not as big as this, so we, we cannot confirm this number exactly, but what we can say that we have been monitoring it, we have seen quite a few groups that were misusing the vulnerability of proxy logon. The first ones were Hafnium. There were, uh, uh, the report says that they were first time seen using this vulnerability in the wild on January 3rd. Two days later, Orange Tsai, which is a known uh, researcher, has reported the information, reported the vulnerability chain to Microsoft. It took them almost two months to fix the issue. I mean, it's not easy to fix it, and you, you cannot break things on the way because MS Exchange servers are quite important. So in the time till they got to releasing the patch, there were other groups trying to already misuse it. And as Hafnium already figured it out, the other groups were not far behind. So before the patch was released, there were at least five other groups already using it for their own benefit. And as you can imagine, if it's publicly known, not everybody can patch right away. So it took only one day for mass exploitation of this vulnerability chain. According to our data, so our telemetry, which is kind of limited because you don't see all the computers in the world. We only see our clients. But we can say that we have seen 5,500 email servers being targeted in 115 countries, which is quite an astonishing number. If you take it, 5,500 can be organizations, each one with one server. So it's a lot of targets, a lot of victims that can be uh, targeted by this. And there were a lot of groups that were misusing it. If I leave the Hafnium out, because that's the one that was really back there in January, we found 11 names that were uh, already misusing it on like the first days of March. Uh, and what is interesting, uh, it was already mentioned in one presentation before this one, and that's the famous Sparrow. That's the analysis that the NCSC was uh, referencing to all the time. And that's, the, that's also a group that was trying to plant backdoors inside those 
uh, MS Exchange servers. So that was added in September. Everything else we have seen actually in the first days of March. Another vulnerability chain, very similar. It's almost a sibling to proxy logon, but far, more, far less exploited than proxy logon, has been found by, again, Orange Sai. This guy seems to be really focused on MS Exchange. Uh, and he reported it uh, during, the, during the summer, summer months in the northern hemisphere, so that everybody is fine with that. Uh, and as you can see, the most targeted regions were Germany and the United States, so they know where these uh, valuable targets are for them. Uh, again, we have been looking at different groups trying to misuse it. Some of the names are quite famous, TA410, TA428 are known groups. Uh, Sparking Goblin and Red Fox Rot, a little bit maybe less. Uh, what is interesting, there was also this application update cluster. Uh, it's an APT group that it, it, these attacks were all similar to each other, but we cannot attribute it to any known group that we are monitoring, or, and we didn't find anybody, anybody else monitoring a group that was behaving like this. So for us, it's hard to say what it is, so we named it only application update cluster. Maybe in the future, when somebody finds a new group, we will find that there is a similar behavior and we can attribute it later on. Uh, they were, this cluster was mostly targeting, uh, again, my cheat sheet, uh, healthcare sector, construction, engineering companies, and local administrations. So they were quite broadly targeted. Uh, what is interesting also with proxy logon and proxy shell is that the APT groups were snatching the servers from each other. Because uh, if they didn't close the uh, vulnerability, it was still open to exploitation. So some, sometimes uh, some organizations were compromised even two or three times. And we don't know if the groups were cooperating or trying to steal uh, uh, exchanges from each other. But yeah, nobody knows that because we don't see into, into the heads of the APT groups. OK, so that's for the APT part. So that's a taste of what, what kind of information we have there on the APT section. And now we are going to jump into the crimeware part. And I moved four slides to the front. Yep. And I'm going to jump to not even this one, even more. Okay. This is going crazy. Not sure if I'm the one doing it or somebody else is controlling this. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm going to go into the data looking at the global overview. So the amount of malware that we have detected in our telemetry in the 2021 in each of the thirds of the year. As you can see, the last year, part of the year is quite busy. It grew by 7.2%. It doesn't seem like much, but these are numbers in hundreds of millions. So the numbers, if they grow even by 1%, it can be in absolute numbers quite interesting. And uh, what's not even accounted for in this graph is the attacks on RDP. So remote desktop protocol, remote access to the computers. I'm going to get to that in the next section. If we look at the top 10 detections, I believe if you look at the names, you don't get that much information. <laughs> uh, it's, the reason is many of those detections are generic. So we are catching a lot of threats by using one type of detection uh, that has commonalities. Uh, Euro was talking about something like that uh, called DNA detection. So this is kind of what it does to the telemetry. So uh, for example, HTML phishing agent is any threat that is an HTML uh, is an typically coming from through email and it's a HTML code in that email that will redirect you to a website where your credentials are being stolen. As you can imagine, this description fits like millions of attacks, so that's why we have it uh, up there. And as you can see, it's almost 20% of all the detections that we have seen in the uh, last four months of 2021. The second one, the exploit from 2017, it's a exploit uh, misusing vulnerability in Microsoft Equation edit Editor. It's a part of Microsoft Office uh, package. It has actually, I think, even been discarded. It's not being used anymore, and the attackers are still targeting it and trying to misuse it to gain access. So it's quite interesting that uh, the old vulnerabilities are still alive and kicking, and the attackers know this and are using it. Uh, one thing that I would point your attention to is the VBA Trojan Downloader Agent. These are VBA macros, uh, Visual Basic for uh, applications. 
these are macros in your Microsoft Office document. So if you download the attachment and click Enable Macros, this is going to be the detection if it's malicious. Uh, what's interesting about it, it's 3.4%. It's not much, right? But the last maybe year and a half, even two years, this was the top detection and it was accounting for 20, 30% of all detections that we have seen. So what happened is that Emotet was taken down and this was the primary user of this uh, type of attack. And as soon as their servers went down, the botnet was taken down, the numbers just crumbled to this number. So uh, went from 20 to 3.4% in our telemetry. And that only shows you how one threat can make a lot of difference in the, in the threat landscape completely. As for geographic distribution, I'm just going to fly through this. And you might not see it that clearly, but the top uh, country that has the detections in the 9.5% region is Japan. So they see probably the most attacks. Uh, I don't know if the reason is that they, are, they should be thought as more gullible in the emails or why they are targeting them the most, but that's what our telemetry says. They are followed by Spain, uh, Spain, Turkey, Poland, and the United States, if you would be interested, because the shading is really close to each other. So that's the overview, the global view. And now, zooming in on the exploits. And I'm, not, I'm jumping to the last section. It's, it's not, uh, I have a reason why I'm going there. Because that's one of the places where billions of attacks are happening every day actually. Because if we was, were looking at the RDP attacks, the attacks on remote access uh, to your computer, so you are working from home, you just type in your name and uh, credentials, and you get to your machine that is sitting on the desk in your office. This is a quite nice target for the attackers, because if they are able to get in and elevate their rights to the admin, they have legitimate access to the network, and they have actually full visibility, they can go anywhere in the network and do whatever they want. So perfect thing for initial access, they can sell it, they can use it for themselves, it can be sold to ransomware gangs. There is a lot of money at stake in a moment when uh, a, when a RDP access has been exploited or the, the protection of password has been broken. What's interesting, you can see uh, in T3, the numbers have exploded. So the number of malicious guesses uh, to access those remote desktop protocols has shot up by 274%, which is an astonishing number, but wait till you see the absolute numbers behind that. But before I get there, there's one more chart that I'm going to show you, and that's an update. So this is for T1. It's not even complete, as you can see. Uh, it's only half of April. And we see there is a lot of dropping. So the dark line in the top shows the unique machines that have been reporting this type of attack every day. And the number has been stagnant for quite a few months already. Now it's dropping and it has dropped by almost a half, which is quite a big difference. So uh, the question is, what's behind it? We know what was the biggest change in the geopolitics and in the world. And it seems that it has also affected this area. So the number of brute force attacks against RDP has plunged in T1. And after the invasion, it has just hit the rock bottom and stayed there. So it didn't improve since then. It can have different explanations why this is happening. But uh, one is that uh, Ukrainian servers might have been hacked and are now down. So they are not running anymore. And this, that's why they cannot attack anymore. The other one is that many of the attacks were run in this, in this area. So there is not much to attack right now because they are down, they are not connected, or nobody's taking care of them and using them, so nobody's attacking them. And the third one is that the attackers don't have time because they have to do something else. <laughs> so it's hard, again, we don't know which of these scenarios is right, but you can see that the numbers are clearly showing there is a decline. Most attacks, Western Europe and, some, and in the Americas, you can see United States is the most targeted. So it doesn't seem to be the, the targets, the, one of the explanations. Now, for the absolute numbers, 29, 288, and 117, those are billions. So it's like crazy numbers. And at the end of 2020, we told like 30 billion attacks. It's so much, that's such a volume that they cannot go over that. Yeah, 10 times. 
in the next year. And as you can see, even though they have dropped down, now we have seen 117 billion attacks until now. So in the first, not even full four months. Uh, one more thing in the exploit section uh, was log4j. Uh, you probably heard about this uh, vulnerability. It has been reported on 10th of December. Our chart starts at 11th December. So only one day after when we had the detection out, there has been a steep increase in exploitation. The reason, and it has been already said in this, during this event, if these uh, vulnerabilities are severe, the attackers will try to misuse them because they give them a lot of space that they can use for their own ends. And this one got 10 out of 10 on the CVSS scale, so that's the perfect score. I don't even remember another one that had such a high score, such a high uh, sever sever severity, sorry, a hard word for me. Log4j uh, was a, if you don't know, it's a library in uh, JavaScript, uh, Java library, which is used for logging some activity. Which is, what is important is that it's an open source utility and a lot of products and even other uh, software have it built in. So for the IT defenders, it was uh, most important to find this library in their systems and find out where it's hidden and to patch it. So that's what was happening till the Christmas or even the end of the year. And the numbers here, they were in together, if you count all the detections in our systems were in millions. And it took only one day to just start exploitation. So a lot of APT groups and even ransomware gangs just jumped on the opportunity. If you look in the top 10 intrusion vectors, so that's the way uh, the, the most used external attacks against networks. If you look at those, log4j is in the number five in the whole year 2021. It's in the fifth place with 5% and it was out there only for, what, 20 days? So quite uh, interesting that how, how big this thing has become only in a few days. And it's still out there and still a lot of uh, vulnerable machines still running unpatched log4j, so they are still trying to misuse it. But the top choice for the attackers is still password guessing. And if you look, MS Exchange, the, the first CVE, 26855, that's proxy logon. And there is another one closer to the bottom, that's the 34473, that's the proxy shell. So they both also made it to the top. Yeah, I don't know, it's not 10, I think it's top 12 here. So that's for exploits. So this type of information you can find there. We will also add information about the attacking servers in the RDP section, for example. So we have new data that will be added in this uh, area. Okay, ransomware. Everybody's asking about the ransomware because this is the top, top, the best topic for media, for everybody. It's understandable. You know, you have been hacked. Peter Cruz was talking about it a lot today. How it looks. What's important to say? Our telemetry is showing only detections of ransomware here and there. Why that happens is that we can stop ransomware at so many times before it attacks, before it's really deployed and starts encrypting your data, that we actually only see a few, maybe hundreds or thousands of detections throughout the, the one period. So th there is not much ransomware to detect at that point, because you stop it as the RDP attack, you stop it as some other type of network intrusion. You might have, you might have stopped it as the downloader that, that came into your uh, inbox. So there is so many ways how to stop it that you don't even see the final payload of ransomware. And the last one, as you can see, there are quite a few spikes in the last four months. Uh, the last one is Rook. So those are the rookies that Peter Kruse has been uh, naming today and describing how they attack. I even took out the uh, landing page they have on dark web. So uh, yeah, he stole everything from me <laughs> at this point. Uh, one, one thing I can add and he didn't mention is that they are using I wouldn't say they are amateurs because they know how to get into your network. They know how to encrypt you, how to uh, extort you. But the, the, the thing is they are using stolen ransom note from Sodinokibi or Revel, if you know them. So they are using somebody else's uh, ransom note and they are using a leaked source code of Babic ransomware, which is a defunct ransomware right now, but it's their source code is available. So they just took components from the internet, put it all together, meshed it up and then went out to use it. So yeah, maybe rookies, but it seems they are getting better too. So 
not a really good not really good news looking at the top 10 again the limitation here is quite clear as you can see we still see WannaCry as one of the most uh, detected ransomware families the reason for this is there is still a lot of unpatched uh, networks out there that still run computers with eternal blue uh, vulner vulnerability explo vulnerabilities exploited by the eternal blue so it's a worm it's living out there and it's still doing some damage but it's not really big numbers even if the, in the top 10 if you think it's thousands of detections around the world in four months it's not going to be that much of a damage but what's interesting, we in the top 10, we sometimes even catch the big game hunters. So the ones that are targeting their, uh, that are choosing their uh, victims wisely and that are trying to double extort them. For example, Sodi no Kibi, uh, Phobos is the same thing, and Logbit too. So even the big game hunters can be caught by antivirus. So this is something that they would claim ransomware cannot be caught by the old time antivirus, it can. There are other new gangs that appeared on the scene, so despite all the law enforcement activity that we have seen. Uh, the last one, Hive, if you never heard of, uh, heard of it, they are quite active. They had a few hundred victims in first months of their activity. The one that was probably most prominent was MediaMarkt. Uh, it's a, probably, you know, this uh, company, they are selling electronics across Europe, and they have been asked for an outrageous ransom, 240 million dollars uh, I would say this was a PR stunt because nobody was expecting that MediaMarkt is going to pay so so much money just to get their servers up and running again especially if they have some backups or something running in the background so they were also willing to offer a lot of discounts and they were haggling about the price but as far as I know MediaMarkt didn't pay it and they had quite a big problem with with high ransomware because they know what they do what changed is that law enforcement started to be very, very active. So, for example, United States offered $20 million for information on Revel, or Sodinokibi, and dark side gangs. And this led also to quite a lot of information, probably, that, that brought them a lot of information, and they were able to arrest a lot of people. Uh, Interpol had some actions. Europol had some actions. In the end, people from Dharma Ransomware, Me uh, Megacortex, uh, Locker Goga, Klopp, uh, Revel affiliates were uh, arrested, including the one that hacked Kasea. So there were quite a lot of big busts. And the biggest one came in January. Again, uh, you would not expect that Russian FSB is going to uh, arrest somebody from the ransomware scene, but it seems that that there was some information and pressure uh, that forced them to do it and ransomware gang revel core members of this gang have been arrested they have raided i think 25 different places in russia to catch most of those people it's more than a dozen that ended up in uh, custody it's not clear what happened to them if this was a hiring process or if this was <laughs> what happened with revel gangs they have been arrested and there was a lot of cash, 20 luxury cars, a lot of money they had already uh, extorted from their victims. Also, some of the good news, we always have a table with decrypted uh, or decrypted ransomware strains or those that closed shop decided not to do anything anymore. So there were quite a few in this case. I'm going to... Jump to downloaders. Uh, again, this is an interesting section because uh, there has been quite a big difference between T1 and T2. That's the Emotet takedown. The last big spike that was caused by, uh, th that was the last uh, big campaign by Emotet. After that, they were raided and everything taken apart. As you can see, that changed the whole landscape and it took half of downloaders down. In T3, it came out again. The reason Emotet has been resurrected. Uh, this is how the raid looked, and Yurai has already showed you a few of the hardware pieces they have been using to run this uh, million heavy uh, botnet. And what is interesting about it, if you look at the numbers, this was the Emoto return in November, so 15th, 16th November. Then there was a December campaign, and one that was after it during Christmas, but there was not much action because people were not online. And now, if you take these numbers, when they started the bot restarted the botnet in November and December, this is where they are today. 
So there have been new campaigns. And after that, there was even a bigger one. And the increase is in more than 8,000%. So they are quite active right now. And it's interesting to see how they were able to return to the game and like fully flood everybody with, with their malware. And they are actually using new tactics. So they are installing also the Co uh, Cobalt Strike Beacon that was mentioned. Uh, one more thing that I'm going to mention before I close this presentation, and that's Android banking. Uh, that's Android malware in general. Uh, as you can see, there was not big change in T3, only 3% increase. But one thing that was interesting to see was that Android banking malware has been increasing throughout the year. At the end of the year, it fell by 20%, but there has been rapid increase in the beginning of the year, so the overall numbers were quite high actually 428% increase in banking malware on Android. What is interesting for you to get a perspective is that this made the amount of banking malware, uh, our banking malware became as prevalent as adware on Androids. And you can see the difference in, in the risk that adware is going to show you some pop-ups and this is going to steal a lot of your personal information and can be quite dangerous. So I could not fit everything in this presentation because the report is quite extensive. Uh, there is a lot of other categories. So if you're interested in cryptocurrency threats, uh, info stealers, web threats, email threats, there is a lot of information there. So I suggest you go to We Live Security and download your own copy. I can keep it up here. It's behind a QR code. So it's just scan it, click it. I see one mobile phone. OK. A few more people. So. And there will be a new one, as you can imagine. So T1 is, it will be closed this week. So next week, we are starting to write another one. So there will be a lot of interesting information. As you, as you have seen with the RDP, with Emotet, there is a lot of new data coming in. Uh, you can also find it on WeLive Security. We have a section for it. Or you can read the research. Again, this is something that Roboliposki already mentioned. Uh, there is a lot of information there, too. Uh, QR code, but I think you don't need that anymore. And that's it from my side. Thank you for your attention. And this, as this is the last presentation, I thank you. So thank you, Andre. Why don't you join me for a, for a few questions before we, uh, before we go? So, you know, interesting to keep seeing, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of development as different threats rise and fall over the time, and you know, see see uh, takedowns that happen, and then things get re resurrected, or they move around, or they get you know recruited by <laughs> different organisations. It's almost a novel. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in um, one of the questions is probably to, let's talk about the uh, sort of. Uh, the other side of it, we've heard from uh, we've heard from uh, NCSE today, and we also we sort of heard from 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 uh, Peter about sort of incident response. But one of the things we've uh, talked about in the past on these sessions is the sort of the law enforcement aspect of it. So, um, you know, does the does you have you seen the sort of the increase in the law enforcement uh, sort of uh, requests for for information and take takedowns on the uh, affecting the ransomware space? As you can see that many of the high-profile ransomware gangs were even hit. So I would say the like cooperation between uh, private vendors and the law enforcement has improved immensely in the last two years. And what helped a lot was also like the big uh, cases such as the uh, Colonial Pipeline and CASEA, where a lot of victims in the United States were hit, which attracted attention from the administration. And then it started to turn the wheels also around the world. So right now, there is a lot of attention on this problem. And the law enforcement like agencies around the world are collecting data to get to these attackers, even, for, uh, even offering to pay millions to just for a piece of information. So. It's really a change in the environment. And for the attackers, this is not really good news. And it's affecting them because you can see there are new players all the time. But still, the, the old ones are 
either closing shop or being arrested. So it's mm -hmm. quite interesting too. So you watch. sort of feel like it might be the, the kind of the, the dying days of the ransomware thing, or you think it's going to continue? Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's dying days because it depends. Maybe they will move somewhere where, again, the authorities will not be crunching them that much or to be out of reach. That's one thing they can do. Uh, we didn't see decrease in the amateurish ransomware, so there are a lot of attackers who are just buying some piece of code or downloading something that's openly available and playing with it. And the ransomware, if it hits you, it's low quality, it destroys your data, you cannot decrypt it, but it's still there. It still mm -hmm. happens, and it's a lot of cases, so we don't see a decline in that area. So, but the big game hunters, it seems that the environment is, has been cha has changed and it's going to be harder for them to do it. And when we're talking about Emotet, for instance, uh, you know, obviously that kind of got, got shut down, and it was a big thing, and, uh, and it really did make an effect on the, on the environment. But uh, you know, obviously Europol at the time was saying that Emotet is you know, extremely dangerous, there's a lot of uh, problems that, you know, that they're causing. Um, what do you sort of see in terms of, the, of their return? Do you, does it look like the same, more of the same? Are they more or less dangerous? Are they more effective? Uh, it seems that they are back with the full force. Uh, they have even improved the malware, so they have new commands, they have new modules they are using. So they did not rest on laurels because the core members of Emotet Gang seems to seem to be out there. So the the people who were arrested were probably some admins who were running the network, but not really the core members developing the code. So if we look at that, yeah, they have still the full gang to run the Emotet, just they need to build up the botnet again. So that's what it seems they are trying to do. And it seems it's successful, at mm -hmm. least for now. So you'd expect to see, you know, amongst, uh, amongst the threats that we, you know, we've seen already, you know, obviously talking about the new threat report that's going to be coming out, you'd see them as being a big factor and in, uh, in increasing sort it, of threat it seems, again. Yeah. yeah, it seems that they will be, again, a player in the market and as you have seen, when they were cut, it changed the whole threat landscape. It can happen again in the opposite direction. So yeah. we'll do everything in our power to stop them. But yeah, yeah, we are also limited. It's interesting that in you know in many people's minds, when you think of cybersecurity, their mind immediately goes to the the sort of uh, you know malware. They go towards you know those types of attacks. But we've seen, as we've seen in, from your presentation, you know, like the RDP. Uh, attacks and the password stealing is the is really like the the bulk of at least the targeted uh, you know s um, attacks that's going on. They're trying to get credentials so they can gain in, and then the malware is deployed, and then they're moving moving sort of laterally. Um, you know, do, what do you sort of can you make any predictions or I, you know sort of talk about what you can expect to see from the sort of RDP on the RDP uh, front in the next few months? Um, as you have seen in the in the chart that I updated, uh, it seems that the RDP has been dropped and it seems to be there all still. So probably we will see how the war efforts will affect this. Seems like we will be looking at more calmer times. So not that many attacks on the RDP. But on the other on the other hand, uh, there are still a lot of vulnerabilities that haven't been found that can be quite crucial. This year we already had the sp uh, lock for spring. So there were other new uh, vulnerabilities out there found and misused by these groups. So they are just waiting for the next one, next thing to come and they mm -hmm. jump on it. So mm -hmm. yeah, maybe RDP is not going to be as prevalent, but those other things are not going away. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like, you know, the, the next couple of months or like coming up to the, you know, what you sort of seen as you just started to put together the threat report, what are the other threats really different or they're pretty much the same threats that we're seeing as continued? Um, I would say it's, going to be similar, but again, the, the techniques that, for example, Emotet is using are high volume. So they are going to change the top 10 and they are going to push some of the threats, some of our detections up in the in the top 10. And we will see also how it changes the landscape uh, geography-wise. So maybe in the geolocations, we will see that they have been shifting from possibly Western Europe to somewhere in the Eastern Europe. There have been quite a, quite a few DDoS attacks in the last few days. So maybe they will target other countries as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, this question has already been answered by you at the end of your slide. So I want to ask uh, where, to, where to get the threat report. Are they released publicly? Uh, yes. Yes, uh, they are available at We Live Security. You can download even the older editions. So we have it all stored there till the beginning of our time, of the threat report time. 
and we will be adding new ones every four months. Uh, plus, if you're interested in like threat intelligence, more deeper technical information, IOCs, uh, we have also private reports. So those are uh, done by our analysts and they are providing much more technical. This is like the threat information overview. So if you're interested in the, in the topic, but if you want to have more technical data, Yara rules and stuff like this, then we have also the private reports. Thank you.